So aloha and welcome to today's information session for the Fulbright U.S. Student Program at UH Manoa. My name is Kristen Connors and I'm the Fulbright Program Advisor for graduate students. I'll be helping to moderate as well as conducting part of the presentation. In today's session, you'll learn about the Fulbright U.S. Student Program and hear from two recent Fulbrighters, gain details about how to apply as a UH Manoa applicant, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. At this time, I'd just like to ask everyone on the panel to go through and say their name um, and if they're a Fulbrighter um, or an advisor. So Betsy, can we start with you? Sure, thanks, Kristen. I'm Betsy Gilliland. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Second Language Studies, and um, I'm the Fulbright Program Advisor for UH Manoa undergraduates and anyone who has recently graduated from Manoa uh, with a bachelor's degree. Thank you. Ricky? Hi, I'm Ricky. I'm Ricky Larkin. I'm also in SLS, um, but I'm a PhD student and I am a Fulbrighter here in Belgium right now on a research grant. And Jay? Hello, everybody. My name is Jay Rich. I recently graduated from the same department, SLS, with my master's. Um, and then I did a Fulbright English teaching assistant, uh, 2021 to 2022. Yeah, and again, my name is Kristen Connors. I work in graduate division, and I'm the Fulbright program advisor for graduate students. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so just to make sure that you are in the right session and, and that you're looking at the right Fulbright program. Um, so we're talking about the Fulbright US Student Program. And there's a lot of different Fulbright programs out there. Um, but this specific program that we're discussing today is intended for students. So um, people who are, are graduating with their undergrad degree, uh, who are master's students or graduate with a master's degree or are current doctoral students, okay? Um, and then we'll go through some of the eligibility criteria in a bit, um, but the main focus of this, of the Fulbright program really is to foster mutual understanding between nations. So while, you know, you might be applying to teach English abroad or to conduct your research or obtain a graduate degree abroad. That's really just the mechanism that gets you to another country. The heart of the Fulbright program is to serve as an ambassador um, and again, kind of build, um, build relationships between nations. Uh, so this is a long-standing program, over 75 years. It's administered by the department, the U.S. Department of State, um, and is managed through IIE. Um, so if you see us, um, you know, uh, if you see IIE plastered places, or um, we mentioned IIE, that's the agency that's been tasked um, to manage the Fulbright U.S. Student Program. Um, so now I, I'd like to have our two Fulbright guests uh, share a little bit about their experience and what Fulbright award they received. Ricky, would you like to start? Yeah, so um, like it says on the slide, I'm a student researcher here doing a grant on linguistic landscape of poke restaurants in Belgium. Um, I, I am finishing my grant now, I'll be done um, I'll be coming back to Hawaii on, on May 2nd, so it's pretty soon. And I'm based here at the University of Antwerp, and they've been really great at providing space to work. And um, there was actually a fire in, in at the university, so they had to uh, give us a, um, a, like a co-working space, but it was super nice. They set us up really well. They've taken care of us. It's been, it's been really good. Um, part, part of the Fulbright experience is also you, you should be volunteering kind of every month, at least a little bit of your time working with the uh, local communities. So what I was doing was doing uh, rock, safe, rock climbing safety techniques um, to, to new rock climbers here. So that's been fun. Yeah. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Kristen, you can see some pictures of me. And this is like a typical Belgian experience. It's very, it's very go to some churches, see some things, lots of beer. 
Fulbright has a lot of events. So we met with the um, ambassador to the EU, her, the, the wife of the ambassador to the EU, let's Libby there. And it, I'm there with some other Fulbrighters as well as um, Erica, the, the Fulbright commissioner is in the picture on the right. So, um, and there's a little picture of one of the poke restaurants that I that I went around. So that my, my time has been spent mostly going around to, to restaurants and talking to people. So it's been pretty nice um, in that regard. So that, that's what I've been doing. Thank you for sharing, Nikki. And Jay, could you tell us about your Fulbright Award and your experience? Yeah, sure. So um, I was an English teaching assistant in Tajikistan, which uh, for those of you who don't know, is a pretty small country in the heart of Central Asia, right between Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and China. So a really interesting place in the world. Um, and where I was was a sort of rural city about two hours away from the capital. And I spent most of my day working in a US embassy funded cultural center called an American space, uh, which is sort of the closest analogy I can come up with is it's kind of like a public library. So it's open to the community for lots of students to come and access technology that they don't have at home, use the internet um, and engage in a lot of different kinds of cultural clubs and lessons that I would be working with them through from ages nine all the way up through adulthood, but primarily high school and college students. Um, so I led a wide variety of different classes about technology, history, programming, prep for SAT, GRE, and TOEFL tests, um, as well as a whole wide variety of other things like karaoke clubs and music clubs and, and different things like that. Um, I also did a lot of work on media literacy, attended a few different conferences, and then read, led several um, intensive trainings about media literacy throughout the country in different cities and different sites. Uh, one of the other really fun things about it was that I ended up becoming sort of a social media celebrity in Tajikistan to the point of being recognized by taxi drivers and people everywhere around the shop um, through a bunch of different programs that the U.S. Embassy had with meeting with famous rappers, cooking with some of my students, you know, local national dishes and things like that. Um, so it was a really uh, wide variety of different opportunities, as well as, um, you know, similarly to Ricky, a lot of interactions with other people on this program and international organizations throughout Tajikistan as well. Lots of, of time networking with um, other NGOs and ambassadors and, and embassy staff from different countries. That's amazing to hear. Um, and before we go to the next slide, Ricky and Jay, uh, what, what prompted you to want to apply for Fulbright? Ricky, do you want to answer that first? Yeah, so um, for the research side of things, I was really interested in um, working and living in Europe for, for the multilingual aspects of it, specifically Belgium, um, because of the, the unique linguistic features of the country. And so I, I, was, I actually visited Belgium once um, in I think 2021, and I had a different idea of what I was going to do for Fulbright, but I had already reached out to a professor to to enter, to meet her when I was here, uh, while I was visiting. And we had this whole hour long conversation that was really nice and really um, productive, but it wasn't at all the topic that I was going to, end, I ended up actually doing. And so after the conversation, I was walking around Antwerp and that's when I observed the kind of poke restaurants and how they're really everywhere here in, in the country. And so that kind of prompted me to think, rethink my whole idea about why I'm coming to Belgium and why do I need to go to the place that I'm going to, what, specifically me from the University of Hawaii, need to do this. So that, that, um, that was it, I guess, yeah. And Jay, what about you? What prompted you to want to apply for Fulbright? <laughs> Um, so kind of similarly to Ricky, I was really interested in the region. Um, I had been to Tajikistan many times in the past. I'd been there as a student to study and then had worked there for a few summers in the past um, and had focused most of my master's research on Tajikistan and the linguistic diversity there. Um, I was not at a place academically where I had time to really focus on a specific research project, and I really wanted to use this Fulbright as an opportunity to do two different things. One, to sort of develop my teaching credibility, to you know get out there and get time in the classroom teaching, figuring out if that was something that I wanted to do more in the future. And on the other hand, to dive more deeply into the culture and to sort of be um, 
you know, to learn more about the people in Tajikistan, to develop more close friendships outside of just the people that I had known in the capital city. Uh, so it really served both those functions. And um, my grandfather had actually been a Fulbright specialist back in 1986 or something. So it kind of felt like a little bit of a family legacy that I should strive to, to uphold. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, hopefully Ricky and Jay's stories resonate with you. Uh, and something to keep in mind is that, again, because this is an ambassadorship, Fulbright is fully committed to embracing diversity and inclusion in all aspects of the program. And so if you think that you have a unique background or characteristic that really should you know, be um, considered as an applicant and to be included in the program, please, please consider applying. <laughs> and as much as you feel comfortable, share those aspects about yourself in the application, uh, because they really are looking to select as much of a diverse um, you know, uh, constituency uh, in the Fulbright program for all their awards. Okay, um, so let's make sure that you're eligible to apply for Fulbright. <laughs> um, and so there's some basic requirements that all applicants have to apply. And then there's going to be some more specific requirements that you should really consider. Um, so if you haven't checked out the Fulbright website, let me just go ahead and drop that link in the chat box. So that's posted in the chat box there. If you haven't visited this website yet, um, please take a look at the eligibility criteria, the different regions or countries you might be considering, and then the country specific requirements. So all applicants must be a US citizen by the time of application. So if I mean if you're still working on the on applying or, or you um, will be receiving your citizenship soon, uh, then certainly that, go for it, <laughs> consider applying. And then for your degree, at the very least, you need to have obtained a bachelor's degree by the time you start your award. So that means ideally you're probably in your last year of your undergraduate program. You could be a master's student who will be graduating uh, next year um, or even this year and is looking for future plans. Uh, or maybe you're a doctoral student and you're planning to conduct research or the ETA also fits into your plans as a doctoral student. So uh, those are, those are the uh, basics that you have to meet. You cannot have earned a doctoral degree by time of application. So let me say that again. In other words, you could be a PhD student and you could be planning to graduate in spring 2024 and you can still apply. We actually had a student once before who applied and was awarded Fulbright and after they earned their PhD went on their Fulbright because when they applied, they had not completed their degree yet. So those are just the general requirements to consider. And then once you've identified the country that you'd like to apply for, review all the details that are listed on the country award page and see are there specific levels of language you have to have obtained for proficiency? Um, are they looking for certain disciplines to apply for this award? If you have to have an affiliate, does it have to be a specific type of organization? For example, some research awards, the countries will say it has to be an academic institution. Um, so again, you wanna look at those details. And you may have heard me mention things like research or ETA or teaching assistant, and you're like, what are these things she's talking about? Um, so there's two main types of awards that Fulbright offers. One is the study research grant, and the other is the English teaching assistant award. So let me go through the, the easier one to understand. So um, 
the ETA is literally you are awarded for anywhere from normally about nine or 10 months, even up to a year to teach English in another country. Uh, again, some countries will require that you have proficiency of the native language there um, and other countries it's fine if you if you have just novice or not even any language proficiency of the native language. Um, so you want to look at the country specific requirements. You don't necessarily need to have like a TESOL or any type of English language teaching certificate or any background in that. That training is provided, um, but again, looking at the country specific requirements, certain countries are going to look for that type of background. Then the study research grant. So that is literally one category, but it covers anyone who wants to do a graduate degree abroad or anyone who wants to conduct research abroad. Um, some countries will have what they call named awards. So it is a specific award to earn a specific graduate degree at a specific institution in that country. Um, and so that is a type of study grant, but is not under the broader study research award category. Um, and then in general, if you are applying for what's listed as open study research, that means that you are literally competing with anyone who wants to do a graduate degree abroad and anyone who wants to do a research award abroad for that specific country. Okay, so for example, Ricky actually, he did a research award, but his was specific. It was an Antwerp, what was the name of it again, Ricky? Antwerp Award? Yeah, it was a, one specific to the University of Antwerp. So there are three basically in Belgium. There's the General Belgium Award that goes anywhere in the country for research. And then there's the ones, ones that are specific to Antwerp and then the University of Antwerp and then the ones that are specific to the University of Ghent. So you really wanna check out um, the country's specific details because maybe they have um, university specific awards and if your uh, contact happens to be at that university that enables you to maybe have a better chance of getting the Fulbright in the end because there's less applicants. The statistics are also all available online as well. Thank you. Yeah, so for example, um, for the study degrees in the UK and Taiwan, there's a whole list of individual universities that are offering awards for specific colleges within their university, like specifically for economics or finance or um, for East Asian studies or, or whatnot. So you want to look for those and, and see if that would be a better match rather than applying for the Open Study Research Grant. Okay, so I'm going to turn things over to um, Betsy, who's going to talk about the application components. All right, so can you hear me okay? All right, good. Um, so the Fulbright application is rather complex uh, because they really want to make sure they're getting as much information as they can in order to make a, a well-informed decision about you. So when you set up an application, you go in and you create yourself an account and then you start the application, you'll have a lot of boxes to fill in and then also several documents that you need to upload. Um, so in terms of some of that information, they want to know um, what do you want to do on your project? So for an English teaching uh, assistantship, it's the main project is teaching English, working in a school of some sort, whatever's in, align, in line with the um, country's requests. Uh, for a research project, you will write an abstract that's about a paragraph long, maybe 200, 300 words, describing very succinctly what you want to do for your research project. Or if you're looking to do a graduate degree, what, what you would be studying or what you would be focusing on in that. Um, degree. Host country engagement, they really want to know also what else are you going to do? Because as you may have picked up from the um, from Kristen's introduction, Fulbright isn't just paying for you to go do this particular project. Um, 
they also want you to be a citizen ambassador. You are going to be making connections with people in the country and they want to know what's something you would like to do while you're there. Um, so you heard Ricky saying that he was teaching rock climbing safety. Um, you can choose whatever you want to do as long as it's something that you've looked into and seen that it fits with what you could do in that country. So if you're an avid rock climber, rock climbing might be a great one or hiking if you like getting out. Maybe you prefer knitting or some other kind of arts engagement. So you might say, I looked on the I looked up the country and it looks like there's lots of people that do knitting. And so I'm hoping to join a knitting club. Um, and and also they want to know what are you going to do after the Fulbright? This is a one to two year commitment and it's intended to be something you do early in your career. So thinking about how will the Fulbright help me as I um, move forward in my life? So it may be that you're, you're planning to go into English teaching. That's great, but maybe you're not. But having a chance to um, live in another country will set you up for all sorts of different careers as well. So giving them a sense of what you're hoping to do. Nobody's gonna hold you to it, but they do wanna know how do you see this fitting in the bigger picture for your life. Then you write two essays. Um, if you're doing a research grant, you'll write a two page description of what you plan to do. And this is where you go into a lot more detail about the research you wanna do, why you wanna do that research, um, what preparation you have for doing the research, because they're really not wanting to send someone who's completely unprepared for the project. Um, if you're doing an English teaching assistantship, it's only one page, but that's also where you can talk a bit more about your teaching philosophy, what you, um, what you would bring to the classroom. Um, and then everybody writes a one page personal statement, which is where you can tell your own story and make a connection to why Fulbright. Um, is this something that you have heard about for a long time and it fits in with your, your life, life's purpose? Um, is it something that you're relatively new to finding out about, but you've had a story that can contribute to your qualifications? Everybody needs then to get um, references. If your project requires a certain level of language proficiency, you will need to have um, a foreign language evaluation, which can be done by a professor here at UH. It could be done by someone else that's an expert in the language. And they'll fill out a form that attests to um, what you're able to do in the language. Um, if you if language proficiency is not required, you don't have to do that for your application, but everybody does need to have three letters of reference. Um, usually from a professor or two who can speak to your academic qualifications, potentially also someone that could talk about your international preparation or your work um, works work qualifications. Um, and then you'll also need to attach your transcripts and for the application. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kristen. This is this could be your um, informal transcripts, right? Um, yes. So, official transcripts or something. Yeah. So as long as it shows your name and the the university you've been studying at, so that it shows what grades you have in which courses, and then um, if you are applying to a research study project that requires an affiliation with a university or other institution in the host country, you would attach a letter from the person that you would be working with at that institution. And for the arts, there's other materials. So you may have a, um, a portfolio of some sort that shows your qualifications in the arts as well. So I think that's it for the components. And we're happy to talk more about individual pieces of it after the presentation's over. So next slide. Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask Ricky oh. and Jay really quickly because I, the, I think that essays, I think we can all agree that essays are probably the toughest part of mm -hmm. the application. Um, Ricky and Jay, can you just go through what was your plan for approaching both the statement of grant purpose and the personal statement? Jay, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I can definitely do that. Um, so for me, the biggest things when it came to sort of the statement of grant purpose was, and this is something I think is really good, useful advice across the board, is when you're thinking about where you're going, really focus on what's important to 
um, that region. So for me, my statement of grant purpose, I really focused in on the idea of critical media literacy and internet disinformation campaigns and how important it was to sort of go into uh, combating that and giving access to English for the purpose of getting students more access to English language internet uh, resources. So I really sort of honed in on that aspect of things and my own background with a little bit of computer science and technology to sort of show what I brought to the table and how it would fit into their needs in the in the region. Um, the personal statement was a lot more where I focused more on how this fit into my career trajectory um, and how it would benefit me and what I, again, what I brought to the table in terms of um, how I was prepared for this program. Um, so in, the, in that case, I mentioned a lot about how I had already lived and studied and worked in Tajikistan before going, um, but that definitely is not something that's necessary. Of the eight people that were ETAs with me the same year, um, only one other student, well actually two other students had been to Tajikistan before, one for a six-week program and one for seven days. Um, so it really isn't necessary to have visited the country necessarily, as long as you can show how it aligns with your um, interests and your professional career. Hey, Vicky, what was your approach to the essays? Yeah, I, I would largely agree with Jay. Um, just to add, in Belgium, we've also had most most um, ETAs and, and research fellows. They they haven't most of them haven't been to Belgium before, or if they have, it's been on a short trip, um, on a vacation or something like that, where they were here for a week or a month. Um, but so, so you don't feel like you need to be uh, have this kind of intense experience, past experience with the country to be able to apply to the country. It's more about um, specifically why you, as as the individual that you are, and your background and your experience, why you fit the country's needs um, for for a either a researcher or an ETA um, or or a scholar. And, and I, I think. Oh, go uh, ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I was going to add something, but finish, finish your thought. Oh, no, go, go ahead. Now, now it's lost. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, All right. Feel free to jump in if you, if you remember what it was. Um, but I, it's also a place for you to really explain your um, readiness for cross-cultural interaction and things. So even if you've never left the United States, by living in Hawaii, you have had a lot of experiences that have prepared you for living in another country. So it's, I mean, there's a wide extreme. There's people who have spent a lot of time in the country they're applying for, and there's people who've never left the United States. And everybody has equal readiness for going. Um, you need to just show the, the Fulbright evaluators that you're, you're someone who won't freak out when you get to this, uh, this new place, um, hear people speaking another language, or see food that you've never tried before. Um, so those are things you can build up in the personal statement as well. Yeah, you reminded me, that reminded me of the, the connection. So I was going to say um, that the, the personal experience is very important. So for example, I'm a, I'm a first generation college student and, and that kind of implies this, as Kristen said earlier, this ambassadorship, right? So we're trying to represent a wide variety of, of experiences from the United States. And if you are thinking about how your specific situation in Hawaii or wherever you are from um, relates to that and incorporate that in the personal statement specifically, that, that I think is beneficial to the, to the application. Thank you so much for that valuable information. Okay, I'll go to the next slide. Sorry, Betsy, thanks. <laughs> oh yeah, no, 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 please jump in if you've got more, more things to add to this. So one of the things you may be wondering is why should I apply to Fulbright? I could apply to any number of other sources of funding if I wanted to go teach English in another country. Um, so one, one thing is what you get in preparation for and during your time in Fulbright. Um, Fulbright buys you a round trip plane ticket they give you a monthly stipend that is um, adequate for living in the country you're going to. You're not going to make. You're not going to become a billionaire um, on Fulbright, but you're also not going to go broke or have to spend your own money for um, for your living expenses. You get accident and sickness benefits. If you are accepted for the ETA program, you'll also get an online TESOL fundamentals course. So you'll have a, a um, 
high quality TESOL certificate program before you leave. So don't, don't worry if you've never had any preparation for teaching English. Um, and then depending on the country and the program, you may get support for dependents. You may get a research allowance. You might, um, if you're applying for a, a graduate degree, you may get the tuition paid for. Um, for your program. Many countries offer some sort of support for language learning, so you can continue learning the local language. Um, there may be enhancement activities, like opportunities to go to professional development conferences, either in your country or in the region. So you may even get to go to other countries um, as part of your grant. Um, and they also have disability-related accommodations, which are depend on the country that you're going to. And then once you're finished with Fulbright, um, you are never, never forgotten by them. So you get um, to be part of the Fulbright Network of Alumni. There's a website and network for State Department alumni programs. So other programs as well that are run by the State Department, um, not just Fulbright. You are qualified for 12 months of non-competitive eligibility hiring status within the federal government, which is a a big deal. If you want a federal job to work for the US government when you return, um, it's a big leg up. So you can, you'll be, um, you'll jump ahead in line of a lot of other people if you're applying for one of those jobs. Um, you get a Fulbright email address for life. So you don't have to keep worrying about renewing your UH email address um, or some other address. And you can join the Fulbright Association, which is a um, nonprofit uh, alumni association of all the Fulbright programs. So not just the Fulbright student program. Um, so it's a, it's a, and of course it's quite a prestigious thing to have on your resume or CV when you're applying for jobs or future graduate school or all kinds of other things afterwards too. So the application timeline, this is pretty much the same every year. The exact due dates change slightly within a day or two, depending on the calendar, um, from year to year. So if you're not thinking you want to apply this year, keep this in mind and double check um, the year that you're ready to apply for the exact dates for the due dates. Um, but the, from now until September, um, you should be getting ready for your application. So really thinking about what project do you want to do, if you need affiliations, who, who are you going to work with? Um, if, you, um, if you need to ask your professors for recommendation letters, do that sooner rather than later. Um, because once school starts in August, it's the deadline's coming up pretty fast. So it's much better to have all of that in place now um, rather than waiting until the last minute. And um, start drafting your application uh, statements as well. We have set the campus deadline as exactly one month before the national deadline. So this coming year, it's September 10th. And um, we'll tell you a little bit more about that on the next slide. But there's a reason that we have this earlier deadline for our campus um, campus application. October 10th is the national deadline. 5 p.m. Eastern is a drop dead. The system shuts down at that exact moment and you cannot get an extension beyond that. So keep that in mind as well, that that is an absolute and they don't, they have no exemptions, um, not even for professors. So this is another reason to get on your professor's case to turn in your recommendation letters earlier rather than later. Then. Um, once all the applications are in, there's several rounds of review. The first one that happens in November and December is done in the US by committees of usually professors um, or other people who are familiar with the, um, the uh, Fulbright program. And they will read your application and they meet and they discuss applications and rank them. So everybody gets a reading by three people. So don't feel like your application is just going to get screened by a computer or something. Um, as long as you meet those minimum qualifications, three people will be reading your application and discussing it and weighing it against other applications in a small pool. Um, 
often it's of some of the applicants for a particular grant. Some, some of the countries have a lot of ETA applicants, for example, and so um, there may be several, several groups reviewing those applications. Some people are selected in that round to then move on to a second round of review, which is done in the host country. So by the Fulbright Commission of that country or people at the US Embassy. And that happens between January and May. So um, you would get a notification usually by early January if you had made it into the second round of review. And then during the second round, they release the results at some point, usually in March and April. Um, so by March, March or, or between March and June, they are making the announcements of the finalists. And so those people now know if they've received a Fulbright and if they are prepared and then they can start preparing to leave. Um, I think that the only thing that, that you need to keep in mind is that as long as you have your application in by that October 10th deadline, um, there is nothing else that you can do. So you submit it and then it's out of your hands. You just wait to hear back. All right, any other? Yeah, so, so then why do we set this deadline a month before the national deadline? This is a way that you can actually get a lot of feedback on your application. So um, what we do is all of the applicants who have submitted their applications by September 10th and indicated UH Manoa as their home institution. So either you're a current student or this is the last university you've attended, um, before moving on to something else. So maybe you finished your bachelor's degree at Manoa and you haven't, you're thinking about maybe applying to a master's degree through one of the Fulbright programs. So then you would be applying through Manoa as were your most recent institution. Um, so what happens, you submit your application through the Fulbright uh, portal and you actually hit submit by September 10th. Um, and we, of course, work on Hawaii time. We don't work on Eastern time. So you have until the end of the day, Hawaii time, September 10th, to get your application in. And then um, once you've submitted it, then we actually have committees. Kristen and I each have a committee of Fulbright alums or people with an interest in Fulbright who are here on campus. And we will read your application and um, schedule a time to do an interview with you where we'll talk a bit more about your interests, why Fulbright, what you expect to get out of it. Um, and we'll also ask you questions about things that we weren't quite clear on with your application. And what that allows us to do is give you some feedback that you can use to improve your application. Um, and then if you want, um, so it, we, we'll give you the option, you can leave your application in if you don't want to do anything more with it. But if you want to take our feedback and improve what you have, we can unsubmit it for you. And so we'll go into the Fulbright system, hit unsubmit, and then you can revise your application. You can play around with the wording. You can write an entirely new statement if you want for your project statement or anything else. And we also will write up a short report for Fulbright about what we talked about. Um, once in a while, somebody in an interview will mention something that they didn't put into their essays, and we think that's actually a really good thing to help your qualifications, and we'll add that into, um, into our, our uh, statement about you. Sometimes you may not realize that something you're doing on campus is actually quite prestigious, um, and so you may not be aware of it, and we can explain that in terms that might be understood by people at other universities or outside of the, um, the UH system. So once you've done that, then um, you'll have until October 10th. And that one is very firm, the October 10th, 5 p.m. Eastern time, which is 11 a.m. Hawaii time. So at that point, you need to submit your revised application or it won't be considered for the, um, for the national uh, competition. I just, Betsy, if I can yeah. jump in, I just wanted to ask Ricky and Jay if you can think way, way, way back to <laughs> the campus interview process. Um, was there anything that you gained 
through the campus interview that you ended up applying to your final submission? What, what, what were there any, basically, what was the benefit for you for the campus interview process? Yeah, um, I can give a little answer. I, I actually have applied twice to Fulbright, once as an ETA and once as a research assistant. Um, once the ETA was during my master's program and then COVID happened and everything got, you know, COVID. But um, so, but each, both times I went through this process of the internal review at the university before submitting the final um, product. And I think that for me personally, the, the internal review is very nice because it allows you to kind of have a, a less judgmental, it's, an, it's a lower stakes, I would say. It's it's the first round of, of eyes on your thing to really get it good, you know, and you, and you want to take advantage of that. I would not um, recommend submitting something, oh, oh, they gave you feedback and then you were like, oh, it's fine anyway, let me just submit it anyway. I would, I would take that feedback into consideration and definitely edit it as much as possible. Um, it's a very kind of junky system, the, the, the application process in the, the actual um, online system is kind of finicky. So you have to work with the character limits that you have and everything like that. And it's difficult, but, but take the feedback to heart and then really try to implement it. I would 100% recommend that. Um, yeah, it's very useful. Yeah, and I think I'd agree with a lot of what Ricky said. Um, one of the really beneficial parts about it is that it is, um, rather than an application that gets reviewed and critiqued, it's very much, uh, they're on your side, they're your team trying to support you and figure out how best to get you that that grant. Um, so rather than you know looking at, at ways to, to tear your, uh, your application apart, they're really looking at how to build it up. And it, it feels that way as they're giving you feedback and, um, and I think that that's a really useful thing. I definitely would agree with Ricky that, you know, whatever feedback they have, do your best to address it because they've looked at a ton of applications um, and have been through this process several times before. So it, it's really useful experienced feedback that they're giving. Um, another really great benefit of it is, um, I know for at least me, and this varies from country to country um, and grant to grant, I also had an interview process during the application in maybe May or so, where I was interviewed by the cultural affairs attache and a representative from the public affairs sector of the U.S. Embassy in Tajikistan. Um, and so having already talked through my application and sort of seen what stood out um, to one panel of people that I didn't really know, uh, it was really useful to sort of prepare me for what kinds of questions, what things might stand out to this other panel in a second interview that I had much later on. Um, so I found that to be really useful sort of uh, baby steps to to the full process. Thank you for sharing your experience. Um, and, and I really appreciate what you said, um, both Ricky and Jay, and I just want to reemphasize that, yes, we are on your side. <laughs> um, any feedback that we're giving you is because we want you so bad to get the grant <laughs> that we're trying to find all the ways to just make your application the best application that it can be. We're not saying that it's a bad application when we see it. We're just trying to make it even better because we know how competitive Fulbright is and that we know that we're not trying to get you to semifinalist status. We're trying to get you the award. So, so yeah, that's, that's really the heart of, of what the process is. Um, yeah, the campus campus interview is not a screening. We don't eliminate people at that stage. We we pass on everybody. As long as you remember to resubmit your application, everybody goes on to the national competition. Um, and we, I, I don't think we would ever be saying really bad things about you. Um, we're we're there to boost you, and and that's part of the. Um, the report that we write after the interview as well is to add things that will help your case uh, beyond what you've said in your own statements. Um, now, before we go on to the application tips and, and general advice, I did drop in the chat box a link uh, where you can sign up for the UH Manoa Fulbright email list. And we will send out uh, emails at minimum monthly, um, as we lead up to the 
application deadline um, to remind you about things that you should be working on or uh, important webinars that are coming up, any changes, et cetera. So if you are not already on that list, please go ahead and, and sign up for that. Okay, here we are, the, me the meat of things, the general advice and tips. Betsy, do you wanna lead us through this? And then we'll all kind of just jump in. <laughs> yes, sure, please. I mean, everybody everybody, jump in because these are, our, these are all things that you as Fulbrighters have gone through. Um, number one, I will say one more time, don't wait, get started now. There are a lot of things in this um, application that do require other people to do things. So, um, as soon as you know who is writing your recommendation letters, put them into the system. It's one. It's an automatic email to them. Once you put their name and contact information in, they get a notification that you've put them down as a recommendation. And um, you want to give them plenty of time. You also need to be sure to give them a heads up. Um, you don't want your professor to be surprised that they got a request for a recommendation letter from you. Um, same with if you need a language evaluation, do that now. Um, the language departments may not be operating over the summer. And so you may not be able to find someone to do an, an evaluation for you. And, um, and then at the beginning of the semester, they're always very overwhelmed with new classes and all of that. So getting your language evaluation done soon is really important. Um, same with writing your statements, because this is not something that you can pull an all-nighter on and get a really good essay out of it. Um, write a draft, get feedback. Talk to Kristen, talk to me, talk to the writing center, um, talk to other people you know. If you're, especially if you're doing a um, research proposal, talk to your professors now to see um, people who are aware of the field or aware of the country too, um, in order to find out if what you're, you're saying you want to study really does fit with the place you want to go and what you want to do. Um, the fourth point is also really important. This is not an application that you can fill in the blanks on a template. This is a very personal thing. Um, both the, the statement of grant purpose and your personal statement really should be coming from you in your voice. And um, so the readers will be able to tell if you fed it into ChatGPT and said, I write me a statement of purpose for Fulbright to go to teach English in this country, um, that won't sound like it's coming from you. So this is really an important piece that needs to be representing your voice. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. I'd also just like to tack on here as well that there is no one profile that each country yep. is looking for. Um, in Tajikistan, there were eight of us, as I mentioned before, and no two of us had you know, basically anything in common in our backgrounds. Um, you know, I was the only one who had any kind of teaching education prior to the program we had on our program as well one of the ETAs was a professional rock climbing instructor and that was a major part of what he built into his application and did in a very mountainous region in the country um, and so those sorts of like individual things that really are interesting about you are exactly what they're looking for because when they're building a cohort every year they're not just saying all right who is going to be the best teacher they're looking at what is going to represent America the most in all of its wide different kinds of diversity. And that's really something that they really want to look at. So I cannot emphasize enough that the authenticity of your application and not just trying to sound like what you think they want is uh, really important. Yep, very much so. Um, yeah, so that, um, and that kind of ties in with the next point about application components that should complement each other. So um, everything, the, the statement of grant purpose, the host country engagement, even your future plan statements should all fit together well. It might, it wouldn't necessarily work if your future plan is I want to be um, I want to be a local politician and all I want to do is work on like repairing the roads right here in Honolulu, although more power to you, we definitely need that. Um, but if that's all you want to do and you have no interest in learning about how other countries repair roads, um, that might not fit so well. Um, but if you're saying this is my goal, 
but I know that South Korea has amazing roads and it would benefit me to do an engineering research project in South Korea to learn about this so that I can take it back to then do, um, do this future work in my life. That fits together much better. Um, so really thinking about you as a whole, your own perspectives on what you want to get out of your, your immediate future and the longer future, um, the more you can fit that together, the better. Um, same with doing your research on the host country. Um, if all you know about the host country is that they make really good tacos, that's not going to really help you stand out against people who are wanting to go to this particular country for reasons that are very integral to what's important in that country. Um, and Jay, do you want to talk now about the, the priorities part as well? I would love to. Yeah, absolutely. So when you're doing research in the host country, there's a couple different really important things. One is researching the host country, the host culture, um, you know, whatever politics. Where I was, especially, it was really important to know some of the sensitivities about what was something that I would be allowed to do versus things that would get me Fulbright and probably the US in a lot of trouble in, in those regions. So that's something that's really important to look into is just generally the, the culture, the society, the, the context that you're going to be in. But another really important thing is looking at what Fulbright looks like in each of these countries. Um, I work now with several other Fulbright alumni, one who did a Fulbright in Turkey, one who did one in Taiwan, and then mine in Tajikistan, though we are three T's of Fulbright none of those experiences really shared much in common at all. Um, where I was, was a post country, which meant that I was, my direct supervisor and the one that I reported to every week was at the U.S. Embassy. So we had our oversight directly from the Department of State um, and sort of the, the U.S. foreign policy ideals were things that we were sort of directly impacted by and directly implementing in the places where we were working. Um, so that was a really big aspect of what my day-to-day -day life was. And so it was good that I knew about that in my application so that I could emphasize U.S. foreign policy ideals and, and things like that in what I wanted to show and do in the country. In Taiwan and in Turkey, both of those have a Fulbright commission. And I believe that Belgium is, is the same, where there's sort of like an independent organization that Oversees, it, oversees things and has their own system of running things, has their own level of checking in on you throughout your Fulbright time, um, as well as their own specific um, priorities and, and goals. Uh, so, you know, in Taiwan, they've made a big deal about how they want uh, Taiwan to become fully bilingual in just, a, you know, a little over a decade. And so they're really pushing strong English education and and things like that in you know young elementary school students. So if you're applying for an ETA in Taiwan, chances are that's what it's going to be: is you're teaching small children, not at a university. If you're applying to Turkey, the Fulbright Commission is going to be really hands off and not really touch you, other than say you're going to be at this university, have fun. Um, and it's a very different experience than than either of the, the other places. So really reach out to alumni for the country that you're interested in and do research about what Fulbright specifically looks like in that country, either through you know, blogs from people who did it and kept track of what they were doing or, or anything else like that. It's really important to understand what Fulbright is actually gonna look like while you're writing your application and putting together what you think is gonna be your plan. To add on Thank to you. that, I did drop in the chat box um, that there are a long list of alumni ambassador for Fulbright that you can reach out to and it'll say what award they received and what country went, they went to and their Fulbright email address. So you can always reach out to them if you have questions and wanna learn more um, about their experience. Ricky, what are um, tips and advice that you wanted to share? Yeah, um, one thing specifically for the scholar program is that I would encourage everybody to reach out to their network if they're trying to figure out who can I contact in the country because I need to have someone write a letter of sponsorship for me. Um, that, that was kind of difficult, right? Because I didn't know anyone in Belgium at the beginning of this experience. And so what I did was I reached out to a friend who had a friend that did a PhD in Belgium and she had a friend that actually did something 
the same field, you know, very much in the same field. So I started reading her work and getting to know the type of stuff she was doing. And then I reached out and yada, yada, yada. It, it was a nice connection and we met and we talked and it worked out. So I would really um, start that process now because if you start it, you know, a few months before the the application is due, then you won't necessarily have time to really find someone and make that connection because that letter um, for, for the for the scholar program at least is is pretty um, foundational for your for your application. That's yeah. Um, yeah and Kristen, can you talk about the funding? Because I'm actually not that familiar with the oh, rules the on additional funding. funding. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. So basically, it's a general rule with all federal funding that you can't have duplicate you. Um, funding for the same purpose. So for example, if you're getting funded for, by one federal agency for travel, you can't get funded by another federal agency for travel as well. You have to choose one or the other. So maybe you could get federal funding through one agency for um, project allowance and research support, but then use federal funding um, for travel. Um, and, and get supported that way. Uh, but if you are applying for more than one fellowship that will overlap in time frame, you might wanna talk to us so that we can work with you and, and determine if you will have to choose just one application or how your applications could be impacted. Um, so we're getting closer to Q&A. Uh, so as I mentioned, if you have a question for us, please put that uh, in the question and answer box and anyone on the panel um, can help answer that. Uh, there's a number of ways you can get connected to us. I did also put our email addresses in the chat box as well. So again, Betsy is the Fulbright Program Advisor for undergraduate students. So that means you're either a current undergrad student or that you are a recent uh, alum who graduated with your bachelor's degree. And then I'm the full right program advisor for graduate students. So you're either a current graduate student at UH Manoa, or you are a master's alum. You, you cannot have already graduated with <laughs> your doctorate to apply, just restating that one more time. So, okay. Um, so let's open it up for Q&A, and then depending on the time that we have left, uh, we can hear any other nuggets of, of tips and advice from our panel. So I'll stop sharing my screen. And I know we have one question so far, uh, which is someone was asking, do most master's students wait until after their first year to apply, seeing as the campus deadline is quite close to the start of the fall semester. Okay, so you're gonna hear this a lot. If you attend any Fulbright webinar, the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, it depends on what your plan is and where the Fulbright award fits in with your long-term plans. Like I said, um, for some students, it works out well that it, it fulfills a requirement for your program, um, or you're gonna use it for your research, for your thesis or your dissertation. Um, and then for others, it, like with Jay, it worked out that, you know, right after he finished his master's degree, he went on his Fulbright. Um, so that's also a very common path for master's students. Other questions? Okay, well, maybe while we wait for questions to pop into the Q&A, because we have about, about 15 minutes left. Um, Jay, Ricky, is there any, or even Betsy, anything else you want to add uh, for applicants to think about? I think something that I would add is really think about Fulbright as an opportunity to sort of explore and get to know yourself as well as the world a lot better. Um, you know, you might be thinking about a specific country because you're familiar with it or you're really, um, you know, you've had a lot of experience with it. But I think this might be a great opportunity to, to sort of broaden your horizons and say, where in the world could this be the only time you visit? Um, I know a lot of people who do Fulbright who basically pick a region that they'd never thought of before and then start looking in depth at each of those countries and figure out where they would fit. Um, and I think that that, you know, it it might sound a little bit strange or scary, but that's a really good way to to sort of expand your horizons and figure out how you can go into these places. Um, if you do this, a lot of times they're also Fulbright specialists, um, which is not part of the US Fulbright student 
program, but it's a different sort of category for sort of short time specialists. And that's something that I know a lot of people who do those programs basically do it to see the world. Uh, and they'll do it where they go for three or four weeks or maybe even shorter periods of time and go work with government officials, local organizations, NGOs, whatever, and sort of see different parts of the world. But one of the great things about the US student Fulbright program is that you're there for a really long time. You're there eight, 10, 12 months, um, which means that you really get to live there and know what it's like and integrate within the culture. And so it's really, there's no better time um, to do that than when you've got full funding. Uh, and I mean, it depends on where you are, how, how far that money will go. In Central Asia, it goes pretty far. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a really great way to sort of uh, expand your horizons and try out different things. And if you're not sure on the specific country, or if you're like Jason, if you're open to exploring where you might want to apply, that's something that Betsy and I can discuss with you. There's a number of what's called undersubscribed countries, meaning that they don't get enough applications to, that are considered as competitive as, as other countries or other awards. So um, sometimes when I talk with students, they have an idea, even they ha might have an idea of one or two countries. And then when I hear what their project is, I say, have you ever considered applying for here? Because that's a major priority for this country. You would, your goals align really, really well with what this country is trying, trying to achieve. Cons take a look, see if you're interested. So. Um, okay, let's see. Someone is asking, would I need to pause my degree to pursue, pursue a Fulbright if granted? Okay, again, that it depends. It really just, the whole timing depends on where it's going to fit in um, to your plan. So uh, if you are doing research uh, for a thesis or a dissertation, you still stay enrolled as a student. Um, that's what Ricky's doing um, because your research goes directly into your degree. So you don't have to stop your enrollment. If it's an ETA, again, depending on your program, maybe there is a component where you need to do like a study abroad experience or some kind of international teaching experience and that could fulfill the requirement. So it, it really, really kind of depends. Let's see, next question. Um, are there benefits or extra requirements associated with being a military member? Also, is it possible to combine the Fulbright with a Boren Award? Oh, really good questions. Okay, let me go for um, the second one first. No, um, be Boren, because that is federally funded, no, you cannot combine Boren. So things like Fulbright Hayes, DDRA, that's a different Fulbright, Fulbright US, Boren, um, you know, there's a Japan language, there's all these different ones that are federally funded. You cannot combine funding, you cannot accept both awards, you're gonna to have to choose just one. As far as being a military member or veteran, you actually are given a consideration, priority consideration for that if you are a military or veteran, so yeah. Other questions? Or Ricky, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, just to follow up, um, there's, so about funding, so if you, depending on the specific country, for example, Belgium, I know because I applied there, they have um, specific scholarships for Americans. So you can look in that kind of funding direction. So, um, and that's from the Belgian side of the funding source, not from the US side. So it, it, that, that in that sense, those can be combined. But if it's a, exactly like Kristen said, if it's a federal uh, grant, you can't do that from the US federal system. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, there are some countries that will, or commissions that will provide additional funding, but uh, for the most part, particularly for research, what I will point out, two very important things that, that you have to have to know, okay. As a UH Manoa graduate student, I can't speak to undergrads and, and what's going on there for graduate students. I know a lot of graduate students end up having a graduate assistantship. You cannot have a GA ship while you are abroad on your Fulbright, okay? You cannot be employed with UH while you are abroad um, on your Fulbright. So that's clear. Um, secondly, uh, we did review the general funding that's provided and the general benefits that are provided by Fulbright, um, but 
it, you know, the level of funding varies. I've had some students when they go abroad, they're like, okay, yeah, it, it's enough, but I really could use a little more or, um, oh, I have no funding for research. They didn't provide me any funding for research. And you have to keep in mind that is not something that is generally provided to all awardees, that research funding, okay? So you may have to apply for like institutional scholarships or fellowships to get funding for your research supplies and equipment, um, you know, and, and for other things and other expenses. Jay, you wanted to say something earlier. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say when it comes to your boring, um, as Kristen mentioned, you cannot get those at the same time. But what you can do is do one and then the other. Um, and something with like boring, that's something that comes with a service obligation as well for the government. So after you complete that, then you have to do some kind of government or nonprofit service um, for a period of time. Um, but if you do a boring and then a Fulbright, then for the duration of your Fulbright, you can sort of put that obligation on pause. So it does sort of extend your, your obligation timeline. And if you are able to receive a BORIN, then that probably means that you can put together a really good application for a Fulbright the following year with more demonstrated um, cross-cultural experience. Um, so, you know, if you've got both of those uh, scholarships as opportunities, I would say go for both just sequentially because you can't do them at the same time. Okay, we have some more questions in the Q&A. So someone is asking if they were previously awarded a Fulbright, congratulations, by the way. If you're previously awarded a Fulbright, um, are you eligible to apply for another Fulbright? Um, and they did list the years that they were awarded. Okay, so we'll have to look specifically at your situation if you're eligible to apply. Um, there, I mean, there should have been enough years that have passed now that you should be eligible. But in general, you can be awarded a Fulbright and receive another Fulbright, um, whether it's the student award, a specialist once you've graduated, um, et cetera. So that is possible. Um, and then someone else is asking a different question, which is if you apply, uh, can you apply two years in a, in a row, um, whether you're awarded or not? Um, Betsy, do you wanna answer that one? Sure. Sorry, I was just looking, trying to look through the Fulbright website to see if they had any set dates for how long ago um, after you've had one Fulbright student award, you could apply for another one, but I couldn't find it yet. Um, in terms of application, so yes, you can apply every year um, that you are eligible. So you might start just before you finish your bachelor's degree, not get it that year, go into a master's degree, apply again, not get it, end up, you know, three years into a PhD degree and finally get a, a Fulbright. Um, and you may have been applying like eight years in a row. Um, so yes, you can apply and there is no cost other than um, time uh, to the Fulbright application. So um, yes, keep doing it. But also, um, do you take do you get feedback on your application because if you've applied for the same thing in the same country several years in a row and not gotten it it may be there's something you're saying that doesn't align with what the country's interested in or with what what a well qualified applicant does so that's why it's also really good to get feedback take that feedback into account talk to people who have done fulbrights in that country talk to um Talk to Fulbright alums, um, look at the, the commission or post information for that particular country as well. Um, yeah. I'll just share and hopefully a story that will be encouraging to everyone. Um, I actually, I worked with a student who applied for Fulbright three times and was awarded on the third time. Um, it wasn't because the application was poor, they made it to the semifinalist round every single time. It was just, it was so competitive. The, the country literally told the applicant, we wish we could award you. We just don't have a mon enough money to award all the people we want to select. So we just had to choose, <laughs> you know, this number of applicants this year. Um, and so finally on the third try, they said, that's it, we, we've wanted to fund you this whole time. We're just giving it to you this time. So um, so please don't give up if you are not awarded. Um, and then back to the other question, if you're awarded, can you apply right after the next year? Again, we'll, we'll have to look at that specific one because I know some people 
apply for like ETA and then they want to do like research or vice versa. So Jay. So I can talk, I can talk a little bit about the ETA side. Usually, yeah. um, again, this is something that depends country to country, um, but especially if, in, if you're applying to one of the countries that is uh, a sort of underrepresented country, one of the ones where they're trying to get more applicants, um, there is often a possibility of sort of renewing an ETA Fulbright. Um, when I was there in Tajikistan, we were told that that was not going to be an option for us in Tajikistan, but in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, both of those countries were allowing Fulbrighters to renew up to three times or renew up to three years. Um, so there were people who were awarded a Fulbright grant in Uzbekistan and then were their grant was renewed two more times. So they were able to stay there for three years. Um, so if that's something that, that you're thinking about, again, it depends country by country. And usually you would not know until well past halfway through your first year about whether or not you would be continuing there the next year or if it was even a possibility. Um, but if you're really dedicated to one country and after you've started a Fulbright ETA position, that's something that you can talk to either the commission or the post um, and just ask them if that is a possibility in that region. Um, you can also ask alumni ahead of time. Oftentimes uh, we talk about these sorts of things a lot within our country and within our particular regions. Um, and so like that, that's why I know about all of Central Asia and what their policies are on ETA renewals. Um, ask alumni what what their thoughts are about, you know, how likely it is in this country to get renewed, how many people try to, um, if they renew one application per year, or if they allow it for, you know, half for all of the people to renew if they want. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so unfortunately, we've run out of time. So I did post Betsy and my email addresses in the chat box again, so you can reach out to us directly. If you're interested in applying, you have questions, we'd love to meet with you and, and get the conversation going. Um, so I do want to give a big mahalo to our um, guest panelists, Ricky Larkin and Jay Rich, um, for sharing their experiences about Fulbright and mahalo to my co-host, fellow FPA, Betsy Gilliland. Uh, thank you also to all of our attendees for joining us today. Um, and we look forward to working with you on your Fulbright application. Take care. Thanks, everybody.